You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, clean energy or dirty fuel? The debate over biomass heats up. Tiny islands, big energy. How Orkney's windy location is driving a green revolution. And we look at the new technology helping airlines reduce their carbon footprint. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. Now, new plans by a UK power plant could increase carbon emissions and household bills, despite being designed to capture pollution. Analysis by energy think tank Ember has found plans to fit carbon capture technology at the Drax plant could cost British taxpayers nearly £32 billion over the next 25 years. And there are already concerns about the power station's choice of energy source. Biomass forms an important part of the UK's low-carbon energy mix and is officially classified as renewable. But that classification is somewhat controversial. So what is biomass and how is it used? <laughs> Let's bring in Dr Mai Bui, Senior Research Associate at the Centre for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. Uh, welcome to you. Now, Ember's report says that Drax's plans will be hugely costly uh, to the taxpayer through subsidies. But how good an environmental project is this? Let's talk about the biomass element of it. Uh, just how green is it as a source of energy? Uh, so with bioenergy, you can kind of do this quite well or also do it quite poorly. So it's really important. And the trick is to kind of do the analysis to make sure that you pick the right sort of cleanest and cost effective approach. And there's a range of different bioenergy sources that you can use. And I think the solution will vary depending on the types um, that you, you kind of select. Um, so I think in terms of the cost, that also varies a lot because of the different choices that we use. And I think there are ways to do it through engineering and uh, economics to try to calculate the sort of most effective approach. And the plan here is to fit the wood-burning plant with carbon capture technology, and they say this will make it a carbon-negative power generator. Do you agree that that's possible? Yes, I believe so. So this is based on a lot of the work that we've done here at Imperial College. Um, there are sort of pathways in order to get a negative or carbon negative um, solution. And, and this depends on how you kind of um, approach the supply chain of your biomass. So making sure, sure you choose the biomass that has the lowest carbon footprint and also trying to maximize the efficiency of the, the plant and the process. And so with the CO2 capture technologies, you can capture a very large proportion of that carbon dioxide. So from 90%, and some studies are now showing you can capture even 99% of that carbon. So a lot of, if you capture the, the most carbon as possible, then you can try to maximize that negative emission um, to offset those, uh, the sort of carbon footprint. Dr. Mai Bui, thanks very much indeed. And you can see a more detailed breakdown of the real-time power mix, including just how much electricity is coming from sources, including biomass, anytime you like. Just head to skynews.com slash climate.
In today's other climate news, the UK is falling behind EU countries in the race to decarbonise the steel industry. That's according to the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. It says the UK only has vague proposals for switching to hydrogen-based steel production, which is believed to be the optimal route to decarbonise the industry. A number of EU countries are already using hydrogen as fuel, while the UK is not expected to fund any projects until 2023. New research suggests more than half of the UK's offshore energy jobs will be in the low carbon industry by 2030. A study by the Robert Gordon University has found the UK's legacy as a leading offshore oil and gas hub will be surpassed by renewable sectors, which could support up to 130,000 green jobs. While many organisations have committed to reach net zero in the coming decades, Kew Royal Botanic Gardens have gone beyond that and pledged to become climate positive by 2030. The company's sustainability strategy aims to go further than carbon neutral and capture more carbon than it emits by investing in nature-based carbon sinks as well as operating sustainably. Now, if you want to see the much-promised green revolution in action, look no further than Orkney. Once utterly reliant on fossil fuels, it's now home to more domestic wind turbines than any other county and produces more energy than it can use. Well, today, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have visited the European Marine Energy Centre to see the work that they've been doing. It's the beginning of a week-long tour of Scotland, which will host the COP26 summit in November. Sky's Rhianna Mills has the latest from Kirkwall. Well, what you quickly find out is how passionate people are here. They talk about being surrounded by renewable energy sources um, since they were kids and they are genuinely connected to their natural environment. But for William and Kate, I think the big thing today has been drawing a focus on how Orkney is a world leader. You have to remember that since 2003, the European Marine Energy Centre has been based here. So it means that all of the world's technology when it comes to wave and tidal power harness the energy from the sea has largely been tested here uh, in the waters. Also what's fascinating with Orkney is that since 2013, 100% of the electricity requirements here has been met by renewable sources. The problem is though, they create so much energy from the likes of wind turbines that that doesn't go back into the grid. The grid can't cope with it. So it's what they do with it. And so what they've been doing is producing hydrogen. And that's where the fascinating bit for the future comes in the projects they're looking at so potentially using hydrogen to power the likes of ferries to heat people's homes even feed it back into industry so things like distilling gin and whiskey so for many people as we head towards cop 26 they genuinely see orkney as a living laboratory that the world can really learn from Projects funded by UK financial institutions are responsible for almost twice Britain's annual carbon emissions. That's according to a new report published by Greenpeace and WWF. They say that while countries are setting ambitious emissions reduction targets, there's no such requirement for the financial sector. So let's take a look at their findings. Well, these are the countries responsible for emitting the most greenhouse gases in 2018. And as you can see, China really leads the way there, emitting around 11 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, followed by the United States and then India. Now, the UK emits far less, meaning it didn't even make the top 10 there. Well, the study estimates that if the City of London was ranked as a country, it would be the ninth largest emitter in the world. Now, that's based on analysis that looks at investments made by 15 major UK banks and 10 asset managers. It suggests they were responsible for 805 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2019. Well, let's bring in our business presenter, Ian King. And Ian, this report suggests that the UK financial firms are responsible uh, for an enormous amount of emissions. But is it as simple as blaming the city, do you think? No, it's not as simple as that, Anna. And I think, quite frankly, the methodology that's been deployed here is a bit silly. I think this whole study is a bit of a gimmick, a bit of a publicity stunt, if you like. But it's worked because we are talking about it. I mean, one of the problems here is that they're confusing financing with consumption or financing with production of emissions. I think you have to 
to take into account that there's presumably some element of double counting involved here, unless they're going to assume that if the uh, financier who's ultimately responsible for an emission is, then presumably the individual or the company that uh, produces that emission ultimately is not to blame for that. So I think you have to take into account things like that. Nonetheless, I think the report does uh, throw into relief the whole debate that's going on here in the city. There is no doubt that investors are taking ESG, environmental, social and governance issues, a lot more seriously. Environmental obviously gets lumped in with those two, though they're not always related, but it's a big, big area of investment, a big area of debate right now. Ian, thanks. Now, the UK Met Office says its advanced weather forecasting can help make flying more efficient. The high-resolution wind data is already helping airlines like Norwegian reduce their carbon emissions. And here's how. The new technology, developed by Swedish company Avtech, aims to replace the standard weather data sent every nine minutes to a plane in flight. Now, it's based on high-resolution data sent at the pilot's request from the Met Office every minute during the cruise phase of a flight. Now, the data takes into account the latest weather conditions as well as the plane's weight, distance, altitude and its speed. And it calculates the best altitude for the plane to take advantage of trailing winds and taking the faster path means using less fuel. Now, Norwegian Airlines has started using the system and it's estimated that it's saving up to 15,000 tonnes of CO2 a year. Now, that's the equivalent of the greenhouse gas emissions of driving 31 million miles in a passenger car. Well, joining me now is Stig Patey, a pilot with Norwegian Air. Hello to you. So just how much difference can this very detailed forecasting data make to flight efficiency and, and lower emissions? Well, as you mentioned, uh, we save about 15,000 uh, tonnes uh, CO2 per year, and it's about 1.6 percentage. And uh, for the pilots, they can also see actually what they can take for action today. They, they get a nice printout with all the details. So they can see on this particular flight, we can save 300 kilograms of uh, CO2. We can save 60 seconds of time. So it makes it very concrete and easily actionable for the, for the pilots. Well, yes, and how much difference does it make to a pilot's job in terms of pre-flight preparation and as well as actually flying the plane? Well, the pre-flight preparation is a separate task they are done, as you say, pre-flight. And, and then this weather data, high resolution data from the UK Met Office, is brought to the aircraft in real time when the aircraft is up in the air. And then they can make last minute uh, updates to the routing based on that uh, data. And it's, it's much more accurate in, in the density of the data, as well as it's in real time. Stig Patey, thanks very much indeed. Well, that's everything from us for today. Coming up next time, big oil on trial. A Dutch court will decide if Shell is legally responsible for climate change. You can find out more here on The Daily Climate Show at the same time tomorrow. Thanks for watching. See you then.